Uh-oh, debate night is almost here. I was about to say here, but it's not here yet. We have to wait a day. Trump's not going to be there. Asa Hutchinson's not going to be there for obviously very different reasons. But joining me now to preview kind of this whole thing is Sean Spicer, who you can watch every single weeknight, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern time, right here on The First TV. Okay, Sean, uh, look, let's deal with the Trump thing first because nobody cares about Asa Hutchinson. It's a calculation to skip a debate. You don't gain points skipping a debate. You lose it's just a matter of, do you, do, you, do you have acceptable losses? And Trump thinks skipping another debate is acceptable. What say you? I think any consultant worth their salt that told him to go would be committing malpractice. Look, this is not, this is not an even race. I mean, you have, the, at best, one other person in double digits. Um, he has twice been the nominee. He doesn't need to explain himself. I think it later in the process, if it becomes a one-on-one -on -one race, uh, especially prior to the Iowa caucuses, then I might change my mind on this. But he has nothing to gain, and I don't think anything much to lose. So if you've seen the fallout from the last debate, basically Trump maintained, if not grew his lead, and the rest of the folks rearranged the deck chairs. DeSantis lost a couple points. Nikki Haley might have picked up a point or two. Vivek Ramaswamy, same thing. Asa dropped off. Uh, but they're all fighting among their their little you know uh, uh, pool there. They're not eating into Trump, and I think Trump realizes that, and it would be absolutely a mistake for him to go. Sean, I, I, I find it interesting in that I, I agree with you on that campaign-wise, politically, from a cold-hearted campaign perspective. It would be a mistake to go. I do think the primary, this primary, is so interesting in that you have hardcore Trump people who feel he is the only way forward, he is the obvious nominee, live or die, it's only Trump. And then you have the other people, and it's not an insignificant portion, no matter how big Trump's lead is, 40, 50 points, they don't want Trump anymore. They're, they're done with it. And, and the, we're, we're, we're facing something interesting. Right, but they have a, I mean, this is like, look, they, they have a, and if that works, if, if the sort of the challenger round works out, meaning if these guys fight it among themselves and come up with, or, or narrow or winnow the field down to one of them taking on Trump, I'm not convinced my, 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 the advice that I was giving um, and, and the analysis that I was giving is based off the fact that it doesn't make sense for him to come. I think it would be entertaining as hell. I mean, I think he'd get up there and start making up nicknames for everybody. Uh, I would be entertained by that. I think we'd make some more news, get some great clips out of it. But at the end of the day, does it make sense for him to do it? And the answer is no. The other folks, frankly, if I was one of them, I don't want him there. I want to make it clear that I, you know, take the stage, make my case, make it clear why I'm the alternative to Trump. Look, when it comes down to the race itself, if you can't beat Trump in one of the early states or come out a damn close second, and I'm talking real close in Iowa and New Hampshire in particular, then this thing's over by Super Tuesday. Look, you think about the race right now, Jesse. Pence and DeSantis are all in in, in in Iowa, and they've made it very clear. So nothing short of a very close second works for there. Christie's all in in New Hampshire, same thing there. And then you've got Haley and Scott, who are both from South Carolina. If you get your butt kicked in a state that you represented for over 10 years, you're not going to be the nominee. So the bottom line is, is that by the time South Carolina is over, either we're going to have somebody who becomes an acceptable alternative to, to make the case against Trump, or it's over. But those are the only two options that exist. Do you think they go after Trump tomorrow night, Sean? They all, they use kid gloves with Trump the first time. As you mentioned, he's still got this huge lead. In my opinion, you have to, no matter who you are, DeSantis, Vivek, even though he'd never touch Trump, but you have to go after Trump hard in this next one, do you not? It's not a question of going after Trump hard. It's, it's distinguishing yourself. If you're, you put it out, you, know, you said a moment ago, and you're absolutely right, Trump's got this hardcore base. And so if you start talking about why Trump is bad and stupid and whatever else, no one's going to side with you. But I think if you can make the case why you're better than him. And so, for example, I would say, hey, look, Donald Trump did some great things. I want to carry on the America First legacy and the MAGA policies. Um, you know, he, he is going to be distracted with a lot of stuff. Here's why I am the better person to carry that mantle, because I'm not going to be distracted by four different lawsuits and indictments. That's a that's a very art, you know, strong argument to make to Trump supporters, which is I don't have a problem with his policies, um, maybe not even his style, but he can't he won't have the bandwidth to do this. So let me do it on behalf of the movement. That to me is an effective strategy. But going after him as a person has largely proven ineffective.
Let's fast forward a bit because Trump himself has three major battles. He has the primary, he has his legal battles, and then he has a general if he does win the primary. Everyone focuses on the first one right now, understandably so, but the other two kind of matter probably a bit more. How's he going to handle the money situation, Sean? I know you follow this stuff. He does not have the campaign money it takes to run for president while funding four different legal fights. He does not. No, you just put your finger on it, Jesse. That's absolutely right. Um, and and the, the, the bigger question is, I mean, in the case of, like, say, Ron DeSantis, where he's run through his, his campaign money quickly, his hard dollars, which we call in the political world, those are the money that you can raise up to 6600 per person. His super PAC is very well funded. He had over $90 million. The point that you're making can't be underscored more. Trump is using that super PAC money to help pay the legal bills, not just of him, but all the supporters that are getting dragged into legal fights. And as someone who has <laughs> seen one or two of these bills, they're not cheap. And so the president has has gone out and made it clear that it, it's in his interest to keep these people in the tent, i.e. pay their legal bills. And I think to your point, this is eating up a lot of money that would be used for ground game, that would be used for ads, et cetera, et cetera. And if he becomes the nominee, he's gonna have to figure out a way to get big donors to come in and help do some things that they haven't been done before, which is almost a two-track system, run the campaign and help pay the legal expenses.